Hello everyone, uh, I'm Meng Xing Tang from Imperial College London. Today, I'm going to introduce to you super-resolution ultrasound imaging. Right, so first, I'll introduce image resolution in ultrasound, and then what is super-resolution, um, how we can achieve super-resolution, then in ultrasound super-resolution, how does it work? I will then introduce uh, some past development in the past decade and then some challenges and some recent advances. So in ultrasound imaging, we know uh, that this is a transducer and we can transmit a pulse, we see the echo, uh, you can form an image. So um, with a resolution cell, if you can see my cursor, this is a resolution cell then it has actually three directions. So this is the lateral, the axial, and the elevational direction. Uh, and uh, the resolution, so you have resolution on all the three directions. So regarding the axial resolution, it is determined by the transmitted spatial pulse length. So this spatial pulse length is again determined by the transmitted uh, center frequency and also the bandwidth of the system. Um, for the lateral resolution and the elevational resolution, they are actually determined by how narrow the beam can focus in the lateral and in the elevational direction. And they are again uh, determined by the transmit, transmission frequency, the aperture size, so the aperture size in elevational direction is this, and in lateral direction is it this and also the depths. So it's the depths of your point of interest. So in ultrasound imaging, we quite often use uh, a number called F number, which is the depths of interest divided by the aperture size. And this you can see is important in determining the lateral and the elevational resolution. So for Image spatial resolution, uh, we know they have three dimensions, but how can we measure even in any dimension, how can we measure the resolution? So first of all, I want to introduce the point spread function of an imaging system. So if you have a point target in here, very small, infinitely small point target, then when you do an image, you will never res resolve this very, very small target, it will always, the image will be blurred. So this is your point spread function. And we know in ultrasound imaging, we have the uh, kind of the radio frequency waves and when you get the envelope, this is actually one direction. So one dimension of this 2D point spread function. So an image resolution, actually the spatial resolution is defined by the minimum distance that the system can resolve between two spatial points. So if you look at, for example, in here, you have two uh, small points and you have the image of them. And the when they are getting closer and closer, you can see at some point you won't be able to resolve. You won't be able to see there are two points within the image. Uh, so that minimum distance that you can still resolve that is the defined as a image spatial resolution. So very often in practice, um, the full width half maximum of the point spread function. So if you have the point spread function in one dimension, the full width half maximum uh, size is often used as an alternative measure of the spatial resolution. However, this one, uh, the first one, is the most rigorous one. So I talked about um, the image resolution in three directions in ultrasound imaging. Then I talked about how you can measure uh, spatial resolution. But what is super resolution? So when people talk about super resolution, they might mean very different things. So some may actually say super resolution when they actually uh, mean significantly improved resolution. But there's a more rigorous definition of super resolution that is when the resolution achieved is beyond the so-called wave diffraction limit. So what is this wave diffraction limit? 
So this, uh, this is a, a German physicist. I believe. He actually found uh, this is in optics, in light. The light with wavelength lambda travel, traveling in a medium with a refractive index n will have a minimum resolvable distance. So this is a wave diffraction limit, r, which is uh, equal to lambda, which is the wavelength of the, of the light, divided by two times the numerical aperture. So this numerical aperture is this refractive index n. So that is really the refractive index of the, so if you have the sensor aperture, you have to point the target of interest, then this um, um, medium, in term, this medium here has a refractive index n, and also sen, times sine theta is a numerical aperture, n times sine theta. And this theta is a half of the angle that the sensor collects signal from the point of interest. So if you think about if it's in the air for optical imaging, then the refractive index n is one. And if you can increase your sensor aperture to infinitely large, you have a very, very big aperture, then this theta will get close to 90 degrees then n times n theta will be one, right? So if this numerical aperture is one, then actually the r is lambda over two. Um, actually, um, now half of a wavelength, so lambda over two, is commonly used in wave-phase imaging approaches. So this is not only optical imaging, but also ultrasound imaging as a diffraction limit, beyond which it is deemed super resolution. Right, so we talked about what is uh, a super resolution in optics and in ultrasound, uh, how we can measure it, but how can we achieve a uh, super resolution? So, while well, some optical and ultrasound super resolution study have been reported in the past, uh, the most notable advance in this area is this um, optical super resolution fluorescence microscopy through this localization. So I'll introduce that in a second. So this is really where the idea of ultrasound super resolution through localization originated from. Right, so first then let's go through this optical super resolution through localization. So what I'm going to play is a video and in here in optics, uh, what you what you see in here is a, a, a cell with a, a, a large number of fluorescence molecules in here. But actually, the, um, some kind of technique has been developed to be able to turn on and off these fluorescence molecules, individual fluorescence molecules, over time. So you can see it created some kind of blinking of these individual molecules. And in this case, if you see there is a, a individual uh, molecule turned on and you see this blob, then you actually can localize it. By localization, I mean you can find, for example, the centroid of this, um, uh, each of the blobs you detected, and then you recall the, 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 cen the center, the, the centroid of that blob. And then over time, you can accumulate this localization. And in the end, what you see in here on the left is a conventional diffraction limited uh, images of this, uh, uh, of this target. But on the right, it's a super resolution image of this target. So if you look at what's, what they have done is about switching. So they use uh, optics, advanced optics tech optical technique to switch on and off these fluorescence molecules uh, individually and sparsely, and then they localize them. This localization is the next step. They find the centroid of the individual fluorescence signals, and then they accumulate them over time. So this is actually the uh, subject of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2014. Right, so how actually exactly the super resolution can be achieved through this localization. So here I just want to give you a little bit more 
uh, explanation here. So if you look at conventional imaging, so say these dots, this has a kind of we know they are the the scatterers with known location. Um, and uh, when the scatterers getting closer and closer, their image just uh, their uh, images will get closer and closer. So if you you just take the look at the image, you can probably tell the two scatterers in here and maybe here. But gradually, it's more difficult. I mean, here you can't really tell. Oh, there are two scatterers uh, in this image. However, in superlocalization-based approach, then here again you have these two scatterers. You have their image totally, uh, almost all overlapping. But if you have a way to actually turn each one of the two scatterers on and off. So first you turn the left on, then you get an image, then you can localize it, find the centroid, so the center of this mass, and then you turn it off and turn the other one on, and then you can find the center of the other, the second scatterer. And then by doing this, you can actually, by accumulating these two dots, you can separate these two scatterers so the key to achieve super resolution through this localization approach is the prior information that only one point scatterer is in the image block. So the scatterers has to be sparse uh, and far apart at one time. And uh, in this case, um, at one time, only one is switched on. Uh, and uh, the second time, the first one is switch off, the second one is switch on. So such localization-based method takes advantage of the much higher precision in our ability to determine the center of the point spread function. Okay, so a super resolution image can be obtained by activating different scatterers and then accumulating the localization over time, right? So now I want to give you uh, um, another example here. So uh, in here, I'm drawing a, a road. And let's say I'm interested in this road. I want to image this road clearly. I'm interested in the, say, the transport structure, infrastructure of a city. So I might have a camera uh, high up in the sky. And uh, I want to see uh, clearly image and resolve this road. Okay. Uh, of course, I mean, there are buildings and structures surrounding this road, and also there are cars uh, on the road. Okay. But if my camera is really high up in the sky, and, and uh, the image could be very blurred, the resolution might not be enough, so I will get a, a very low resolution image, and the road is not uh, clear, it's not resolvable. So, how can I resolve this road? How can I get a, a, a super resolution image of this road? So one idea is actually we can image in the night. So when everything is dark and then we pack the road with cars, but only turn on the headlight of say a couple of cars. So, of course, I mean, if your camera is, uh, is uh, far away, uh, you won't be able to resolve this car, but what you can see uh, in the darkness is actually two glowing blobs, right? And then if we can localize uh, the center, the centroid uh, of these blobs, and then we know where the cars are, right? Although the image you get is much bigger than a car, but you know you actually can localize where the cars are. Uh, and then if we have the way to, for example, turn the headlights of those two cars off and turn the headlights on for another two cars, like in here and here, then we get an, uh, another image with uh, two such blobs. And again, we can localize their center. And then by just keep turning off and on the headlight of different cars and accumulating their cen centroids. And then in the end, we can generate a super resolution image of the road. Okay, so 
uh, that's a uh, um, uh, an example of how this super resolution works. But in the context of biomedical imaging, we'll say we're looking at a piece of tissue and you have the blood vessel seen here. It's just like, for example, our, our road, they're just um, they're transporting blood and nutrition. And then you have the tissue in between. Yeah, that's how like uh, you have buildings uh, next to the road and here you have lots of tissues between the blood vessels. Okay, so we have tissue with embedded blood vessels and the blood vessels are particularly uh, of interest, especially both, um, both uh, micro and, uh, and the micro vessels as their geometry and flow um, are closely related to the status of the surrounding tissue. Right? Um, example is like if for example, if uh, the uh, early development of cancer is a so-called angiogenesis where small vessels form. And a clinical system, a typical one, cannot really resolve blood vessels, uh, small blood vessels, like uh, below a few hundred of microns, although they can be very uh, uh, um, important and carry important information. Um, and another problem is that the surrounding tissue, although this is an optical image, and the surrounding tissue structure can give you much higher echo in ultrasound than the, the blood vessel. So to be able to do ultrasound super resolution of these vessels, what we need are really these three things. We need some agent within the vessel, uh, like the cars on the road, um, and then we need to have a way to turn the surrounding tissue dark, right? And only the, the cars can be available and uh, can be visible. And uh, also we need a way to be able to switch on and off the individual agent. That's like turning on or off the, the car's headlight. So for the first point, agent within the vessel, like the cars on the road, we can, in ultrasound, we have microbubble contrast agent, which can be injected into the bloodstream, into the vessels intravenously. So that's tick. Um, and uh, we also, the second, we need a way to turn the surrounding tissue dark. Actually, we do have such technology. We have varying filtering techniques. For example, the pulse inversion, uh, or the singular value decomposition. These are the existing techniques which can remove the tissue background from the echo signal and only keep, for example, the contrast agent, the micro bubble signal. And uh, the third point is we need a way to be able to switch on and off individual agents. And this is a problem because actually the bubbles are always on, they're always visible to ultrasound, you don't have a way to keep them dark in the beginning and turn them on. However, um, we have flow. So in the uh, blood vessel, actually the blood flows. So when bubbles are injected in the blood, they move with uh, the blood flow. And when a bubble, so this is quite uh, uh, um, a key point, when a bubble move between frames, uh, it is as if the bubble in the previous position has been switched off and switched on as a new position. So basically, if you think about our previous example of cars on the road, then in the optical super resolution, uh, it's like you pack the road with cars and then you turn on and off individual cars headlight. But in here, what we do is on the road, we don't pack them with cars. We only have a few cars that's far apart uh, and turn, turn on their light so we don't turn them off. They're always on, but we let them move. And then while they're moving, we can track these individual cars and localize their position. So that can also uh, achieve this super localization. So uh, let's um, show you some real data. So there is a micro vessel in here, and this is actually the signal of a micro bubble contrast agent. So when I play the video, you will see actually the flow is going from the right to the left, and you can see the, the signals uh, appearing 
on the right and uh, moving towards the left. Uh, and if you find this individual bubble signal and then you localize them, find the center of them and accumulate them over time, you will generate this super resolution image of this vessel and uh, the diameter of your resulted image uh, when you measure it corresponds is a 200 micron tube and correspond to to what we know the diameter, the real di diameter very well. Okay, so what actually is, what do you need to do uh, to generate this super resolution? This is a typical workflow in ultrasound, so USSR stands for ultrasound super resolution. So first step, you need to acquire the data, so you transmit pulse, receive echo, you get your data, right? And then the second part is about um, detecting this agent. It's like uh, making the tissue surrounding structures dark, and then you, you can make the agent signal stand out. So that's a detection stage. And then there's the isolation stage where you can see some of the, the agents, the bubbles are, are separated, they are apart, but some of them are close together. And when, when they are close together, the signal mixed up, so when you look, you find the centroid of it, it will be in the wrong position. So we need to remove this and only uh, find the isolated uh, individual bubbles. And then you can, if you can see here, there are dots. So that is the centroiding. Uh, after the localization, we find the centroids of these signals. And then this is only one frame, but if you have multiple frames over time, then you can do some tracking of these bubbles as they move along the image. And then after accumulating this localization signal, you can generate a, uh, a final image through this uh, localization mapping. So, um, so there are a number of factors here I want to talk about. First the stage acquisition. There are some parameters are really uh, uh, important here. One is the frame rate. So if your frame rate is too low, uh, then actually you could have problems in terms of tracking bubbles. Um, and also the imaging sequences, you can have a B-mode image, you can have, uh, for example, this pulse inversion image that, uh, that's specific to contrast agents. They will make a difference to your images. And also the imaging frequency, so if you use a very high frequency, your, your starting spatial resolution will be quite high. And that means you can actually get more possibly more because your, your resolution cell is much smaller. So you can actually get more bubbles, potentially more bubbles in, in a single image. Um, but at higher frequency, many bubbles are not very active on the ultrasound uh, and uh, your signal could be weaker. And uh, another parameter is mechanical index. And uh, we know that in bubble imaging, you always use lower mechanical index. If it's too high, you can pop the bubble. Um, another um, and the parameter is in this detection stage. The include also this pre-super resolution processing. So you can have this nonlinear filtering that is to, to remove the background tissue and make the agent stand out. SVD also can do similar, uh, similar things in terms of removing the background tissue, although it has some problems, inherent problems. And uh, the denoising, uh, sometimes the image can be quite noisy, especially when there's a high frequency image when the bubble signal are quite weak. And uh, also the, uh, sometimes you do need this background subtraction to remove some structure that's not really bubble signal. And then you have this isolation of individual single bubbles. You need to localize them. Uh, you need some tracking methods. and uh, actually lots of work going on in terms of uh, improving each stage of this uh, super resolution process. Another point I want to 
make is that bubble concentration really matters. And uh, if you have, I will talk this later uh, more uh, in detail, but if you have more bubbles, then you could have more localizations in a single frame that could speed up your, your uh, support solution process. But also it has a danger of bubble just mix up together. You can't isolate them and you can't track them well. Right, those are, so I talked about how this super resolution work um, and uh, particularly ultrasound imaging. I will now give you some you know, more um, uh, early developments, some examples of early developments. So these are studies where they show, so these two conference proceeding papers show the um, uh, demonstrated the super localization of the bubble signal. And then uh, uh, later on, in 2013, these two, conf uh, these two journal paper actually demonstrated the super resolution imaging by separating uh, closely spaced structures. Right, this is actually the first in vivo demonstration of not only super resolution, but super resolved velocity mapping so what you're looking at here, so this is actually the optical image of this uh, structure. And this is a conventional ultrasound image. You can see it's quite blurred. Um, but if you see here, when we put in the bubble and uh, looking at the image over time, you actually can see these individual bubbles moving around this vessel. So these are just like the cars moving around the road. If you can see this individual, signal, you can localize them, then you can actually accumulate the localization and generate a super resolution image like this. And not only you can generate a super resolution image of the localization density, so the density of your number of localizations, but also you can, because the bubble, you can track them over time, then you can generate images of the flow directions and the images of the flow velocity. So this is uh, another early development in red brain super resolution image. When I play this video, you can see the accumulation of the signal over time in a uh, part of the red brain. And uh, this is actually the final super resolution results in a single 2D plan. Um, but actually you can do this in multiple 2D plan. Uh, and and uh, you can also display this in a, a kind of in a 3D way when you have this uh, 3D information. And there are also a number of other studies. I just listed uh, a, a few studies. They are, they are just uh, examples of, of this in vivo uh, super resolution. This is a tumor model. These are the um, uh, rapid kidney. And uh, this is actually a atherosclerotic model of this of a zone uh, that's um, the microvessels that's on the uh, on the vessel uh, on a the wall of uh, aorta abdominal aorta. Right. So this is another uh, uh, work we have done recently. So this is a lymph node. It's a rapid lymph node. It's a quite small one, four millimeter roughly in diameter. And this is a B-mode image. This is a contrast image where you can see the micro bubbles moving around um, in the microvasculature in these lymph nodes. And through localizing and accumulating this localization over time, you can generate a super resolution image of this lymph node microvasculature and also the super resolved velocity maps of this uh, vasculature. And the also, in this study, they demonstrated the uh, resolution to be at least is on uh, 30 microns by separating these two vessels. Um, and they're quite actually confident these are two vessels because they also track the velocity and you can see the color telling you that the flows are in opposite ways. Right, not only this super resolution uh, technology has been used uh, in, in animal, in vivo, 
but also they have already been trialed in human. So these are again just some uh, uh, first human uh, application examples. So this is a, uh, a results reported on human test testicular uh, lesion. And uh, this is the uh, um, report of the super resolution imaging on human breast cancer patients. And this is actually a report of super resolution on human lower limbs, the microvasculature in human limbs. Right, so these are really, um, I've showed you some example. Um, it looks wonderful, but there are lots of challenges still uh, exist. Uh, so one of the key challenge is the acquisition time. So at the moment, it is the acquisition time is quite long, typically tens of seconds, some maybe a bit less, some even more if you're looking at uh, a 3D uh, scanning. So um, bubble concentration actually matters because in, in here we want to localize these individual bubbles so they can't be very close. And if you use a lower concentration, they slow you down, right? Because you need to accumulate a sufficient number of this um, bubble signal. Um, and also, since we need flow, it takes extra time to image slow flow in small vessel because you have to wait until the, uh, the small vessel uh, are perfused uh, with this uh, agent. Okay, another challenge is tissue motion. Um, so um, tissue always moves, especially if it takes time to acquire your data, uh, tissue always move. And uh, to correct this motion, particularly in here, when we're talking about uh, spatial resolution in the level of tens of microns, then the tissue motion correction accuracy will have to be at least at that level. Um, and another challenge is tracking bubbles, particularly when the bubble concentration is high and the frame rate is low, how to best track these bubbles, that's another challenge. And the limitations with 2D imaging because you only achieve super resolution within the imaging plan, but in the elevational direction, you're still diffraction limited in resolution. Um, and another problem with 2D imaging is when you have out of plane motion, then there's really very little you can do about it. So we need to develop 3D imaging technology, and that is what you're looking at here. So these are different uh, studies on imaging, 3D super resolution imaging using different type of probes, customized, uh, this is a kind of helmet-like probe, uh, and uh, this is a full 2D matrix array, this is a sparse array, and this is a row column array. You can see uh, where in, for example, in this case, two uh, kind of twisted microtubes, 200 microns each, can be uh, spatially resolved by this 2D sparse array. Okay, so for the long acquisition time, uh, what can we do? So one of the possibilities to increase bubble concentration, and then we can use some advanced image processing to deal with that. So potentially more bubbles can be detected at, at every frame. So the number of frames you need uh, to generate this super resolution will be less so less time required, um, but they need more robust uh, signal processing, image processing to separate, isolate, and track, track this bubble signal. And if the bubble get too close, they can even physically interact. That will be uh, another challenge. So a number of initial studies has been reported using the different techniques like deconvolution, sparsity-based image reconstruction, pattern recognition, machine learning algorithms uh, to deal with a higher concentration uh, um, situation. But here I am introducing to you another potential solution to this um, uh, long acquisition time problem is to use this so-called phase change contrast agent. Because if you remember, I talked about in optical imaging, they can actually turn on and off this agent, but micro bubbles cannot be turned on, they're always on. But this phase, contra phase change contrast agent can be activated, they can be turned on. So I'm showing you the movies of 
uh, if you look at initially these nano droplets, these are perfluorocarbon nano droplets, and in the beginning they are they're not visible to light and also to sound, but after some ultrasound excitation, they pop into bubbles and they're visible to both the light and sound. So we actually have tried to use this to turn on and off this um, uh, nano droplets to do super resolution. So this is our cross tube phantom, and this has a kind of every time when you have a flash, that is another kind of a group of this uh, droplets being turned off and on. This and by detecting this signal and accumulating over time then you can generate these super resolution images comparing to this diffraction limited images and comparing to this optical uh, images. And if you look at the resolution, you can see that it can separate structures that the conventional uh, B-mode image cannot. And also more recently, we have developed this, um, um, so the, the previous, um, uh, so this technique we call the acoustic wave sparsely activated localization micro microscopy or, or we call uh, also known as awesome. And uh, so now we have developed a, I move to the next slide. Um, we developed a fast version of awesome by just actually changing the type of nano droplets, the phase change contrast agent we use. We can now uh, use plane wave to activate and image them at the same time. So I'm going to play you a movie. Okay. So, oops, sorry about this. Apologize about this. Right. So you can see this is water, nothing is happening for micro bubbles. Uh, you see some signal and the accumulation, let me stop because there's no bubble uh, left in there. But when you have the nano droplets, when we turn them on and off, you see this uh, kind of flashing uh, signal and then you can accumulate, you detect and accumulate the localization. And you can see even within 50 milliseconds, you generate a, uh, already uh, a, a pretty decent super resolution image. Right, so um, in this talk, what I have covered, uh, I introduce resolution in ultrasound, what is super resolution, how we can achieve super resolution, uh, and how this ultrasound super localization works, some development in the past decade, and some challenges and more recent advances. So I would like to acknowledge my uh, collaborator Rob Axley and uh, Chris Dunsby and all the group members who have contributed to the um, to the data I, sh I showed uh, in this presentation. Thank you.